while we're doing this, we're trying to put these books of the Old Testament uh, with the with the time frame in which they actually happened. When we come up to the book of Exodus, Abraham is dead, Isaac is passed away, Jacob is passed away, and Joseph is now passed away. And this time span where Israel is in Egypt is some 400 years. And I think your timeline, if you have it, uh, says 430 years. And I can go along with that. It's somewhere around 400 years. And we've come from a single son, uh, the son of Abraham. Uh, his name was Isaac. And uh, then we went to the 12 sons of Jacob, and, uh, and now, in the book of Exodus, we have moved to a population of Israel that I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe by the time they exodus, by the time they exit Egypt, uh, up in the millions. Now, I don't know if that's right or not. I asked my wife, she said, I can't even remember how many kids we got. So, <laughs> so don't fact check me, but I'm pretty sure uh, we're up in the millions of, of people. <coughs> by the time of the exodus. The exodus is just what you would think it means. It means an exiting of God's people out of Egypt. When, when we use the term God's people or God's children, uh, I need to make it clear that we use that in two different ways. Either we are talking about Israel, the people of Israel, which is God's earthly chosen people, earthly chosen people, the children of Israel. Or we use the term God's people, meaning all believers, every saint of God, both Jew and Gentile, all the redeemed of God. And uh, we have to make that clear because apparently there's some folks going around all, uh, in this world today teaching that if you're a natural born Jew, that you're saved automatically just because you're a, a, a child of Abraham or a natural born Jew. And I'm telling you, that's simply not true. Nicodemus had to be born again. And, uh, and, and Peter wasn't saved until he came to believe that Christ was the Son of the living God. And Paul had to be saved by grace through faith. And all of those men were natural born Jews. So I need to clarify, when we say the children of God or the people of God, uh, it could be meaning Israel or it could mean all of the saved, but that's not the same thing. However, Israel in the Old Testament can be used as a type or a picture of the family of God. And Egypt can be used as a type of the world, the world that we live in. And thank God this world is not our home. One of these days we're going to exit out of here. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, if you're saved, you're not even, a, the world is not even a friend or an ally to you. In fact, the family of God, if I can say it like this, the family of God is a grievance to the world just like Israel was a grievance to, to Egypt. I'll give you an example of that. If it were not for believers in America today, if it were not for some true churches and some, some believers in America today, we would already be a pagan nation. We would already be one. Uh, but that's not the case. You see, the Christians, the believers, we slow down what the world calls quote-unquote progress. We're slowing down their progress. Uh, we are deplorables to this world. The world wants to enslave us, but our connection to God hinders this world's plans in a great way. And I'm going to get to that here in just a minute. But let's look at Israel and Egypt and make some comparisons uh, with the with the children of God in this world. Number one, they had the hand of God on them. I mean, they had they they multiplied and waxed uh, mighty in Egypt. 
They had the hand of God on There's an old song that says this, there is an unseen hand to me. Talking about the hand of God. God had His hand on Israel and Egypt couldn't do anything about it. Israel had a special origin. Uh, they, they could not claim, Egypt, the world, Egypt could not claim that they created Israel. They did not create Israel. And by the way, the world did not create Christianity either. There's a special origin. By this time, we get to the book of Exodus, by this time they've been called by two names so far. Now there's actually three names, uh, but so far they've been called by two of the three names. They've been called Israelites, which means they dis they're descendants of Jacob, and they've been called Hebrews now in, uh, in, in, in Exodus chapter 1, which means they are descendants of Heber, and that guy is Abraham's great, 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 I don't know how many greats, grandpa. And so they've been called by these two names. Later on, they'll be referred to as Jews or as a Jew, which is a descendant of Judah, one of the tribes of Israel. And so, they've been called by names, and the Egyptians could not claim any of this. They couldn't claim that they created any of this. Whatever it is that these people had become, Egypt could not say, we did this. Let me throw a couple of names out here at you. And I've already said one of them. What about the name Christian? They were first called Christians at Antioch. The world hates the fact that it cannot claim to have created Christianity. I mean, they'd have you believe that. Uh, but they can't claim that. We have an origin of divine creativity. Christianity came from Christ. Here's another name. What about the name Baptist? Amen, preacher. The world created Catholicism. The world can claim they, re they created Reformed denominations, but only Jesus set forth Baptist. Our name goes all the way back to Him and the church He started. They had the hand of God. They had a supernatural strength and perseverance. Verse number 7 said, And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them. Even under distress and persecution, verse 12, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Kind of like missionaries on the foreign field. Somebody said amen. Even with every attempt to destroy them, they persevered. Verses 19 and 20. And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. With every attempt to destroy the livelihood, the freedom of the people of God, <coughs> the hand of God was on them. I like that word they used about the Hebrew women that said they were lively. In other words, they, they're healthier than most of the women. Uh, they're delivering before the midwives even get in there. Now, I don't know if they were lying about that or not, but... Uh, but that's what it says. And I thought about that, folks. The Lord's people and the Lord's churches may be stressed and persecuted and mocked in this world. It may be uh, that, it, uh, that if we were normal, we'd just close up the doors of our church and give up on Christianity or even worse, conform to the ways of this world. But thank God there's still some life left in God's house and in God's people. It's all because of the hand of God on us. Go down through the history of Christianity. 
the history of Baptist churches and you'll find God's hand in the worst of times there was a supernatural strength and perseverance. The world hates us for that. Number two, there was the wisdom of God with these people. In chapter 1, verses 8, 9, and 10, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more mightier than we. Let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when they fall without any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. The world despises the people of God because with them there is a wisdom that comes from another world. They said, let us deal wisely, and they're talking about let us deal wisely in a worldly sense with them. But they, let me say it like this, God outsmarted them. It's a, the wisdom of God is a Practical wisdom. It's not knowledge based. It's not intellectual. Listen, knowledge is a wonderful thing, but wisdom is when you put the knowledge in action. Wisdom is where we get down to where we live, where the rubber meets the road. It's a practical wisdom. The world relies on intellectual argument while the family of God says, hey, the proof is in the pudding. How's that working for you? Intellect says the church is non essential in America. Wisdom says, how's that working for us? Intellect says we don't need the Bible to govern our nation. Wisdom of God says, how's that working for us? Intellectualism says, surely we can make America great again. I tell you, we've been trying. And it ain't working without God. Not working too good. It's a practical wisdom. God is the ancient of days, the Bible says. Something interesting in verse number 8. Pharaoh didn't know Joseph from Adam. Never met him before. Joseph died before this Pharaoh came on the scene. Pharaoh didn't know Joseph, but God did. God was there when Joseph was sent down into Egypt. God was there before there ever was a Joseph. I like what Jesus told the Pharisees when they started bragging about their lineage to Abraham. He said, I'll tell you something about Abraham. Before he was, I mean. God was there from the beginning. Listen, our world that we live in today doesn't know anything about creation, but God, God does. He was there. The world doesn't know anything about how to deal with the nation of Israel in our world today, but God does. He was there when they started that thing. The world doesn't know anything about the cross of Calvary, but God does. He was there when His own Son hung and bled and died on the cross. The world doesn't know anything about the empty tomb. They're willing to believe a lie that the body was stolen. The Bible says that rumor is still going on even to this day. When that scripture was written, that, that rumor was still going around. The world's willing to believe that, but God knows He was there the day the stone was rolled away. And the world can't see my heart and inside my heart or inside your heart, and it doesn't know my spiritual state, but God does. He was there the day I got saved. <coughs> And this world doesn't know Christ and couldn't recognize a real church if it jumped up and slapped them in the face. But God does. Worldly leaders and politicians try to lead us in spiritual matters and they don't know the first thing about it. How do you know, preacher? Well, that's because anytime a spiritual matter comes up, they always call on the Graham family. Let's call Billy Graham and Franklin Graham. I don't have nothing against those guys. But how come our own leaders can't pray for our nation? How come our own leaders can't proclaim the truth of God's Word? They don't know the first thing about it. And the world hates that because it doesn't know. There's something that it doesn't know. There's a wisdom that is beyond the grasp of this world. 
Not only that, but God is the author of history. This story of humanity, this story of this creation and this world, it will go like God says it will go. That the world has no control over how things are going to end. Verse 17 God's wisdom puts strategic people in place. I thought about those midwives. That was strategic. Let me tell you, let me tell you the world strategy when it comes to putting people in places uh, of, of authority. The world comes up with Goliaths and God shoots them down with a slingshot. The, the, world, the world puts up Ahabs and Jezebels and they end up dying by the sword. The world sets up a Caiaphas and a Herod to try to thwart the plans of God and His people. And they, 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 God, God circumvents them. He, he navigates around that in His wisdom. God sets up Nero. Uh, uh, the world sets up Negroes. God, uh, the world sets up, hey, here's one, the world sets up Joe Bidens. And God outsmarts them all. God has Moseses. God has uh, the Apostle Paul. God has Stephens. God has George Washingtons that he puts in places in strategic times throughout history. In verse 21, God's wisdom, in His wisdom there is better incentive. It says there that, that, the, that the midwives feared God, feared God and He made them houses. He took care of them because of their fear and service to the Lord. Let me tell you what the world does for incentive. They'll put money in front of you. They'll put sinful pleasures in front of you. In front of us to get us to comply and to conform with the ways of these world. But here's the thing, friends. If we'll get a taste, if you get a taste of the goodness of God, it doesn't matter what the world offers you. It'll be keep your money, keep your <coughs> pleasures, Keep all of that and just let me get down to the house of God where there's some glory and some blessing. Just let God open up His windows of heaven and pour out His blessing on me. God has better incentive. There's a wisdom to the things of God that the world cannot combat and they cannot compete with. And number three... There was the authority of God within these people. In verse number 18, Pharaoh asked the midwives, he said, why have ye done this thing and have saved the men, children, and life? In other words, he was taken aback. He was astounded at the fact that they did not do what he told them to do. Two times, verse 17 and then verse 21, it tells us that they feared God. Boy, the world hates it. Pharaoh was a terror. He was a force to be reckoned with. But in their minds and in their hearts, God was even the more so. The people of God fear God more. Amen. We fear God more than the government coming down and shutting down our churches. We fear God more than COVID-19. Amen. We fear God more than being left behind in the trends of society and quote-unquote progress and social progress. We fear God more than that. His authority. God is not obligated to exalt Egypt. I'm sure Pharaoh thought he was. I'm sure Pharaoh thought if there's a God in heaven, surely he wants to exalt Egypt. But I'll tell you something about God. He was unimpressed by Pharaoh's power. And I'll tell you something else. God is unimpressed by Trump's money. Amen. God is unimpressed by the protests of wicked people. God is unimpressed by pride parades. Y'all know what I'm talking about? 
Listen, God is not bound by the vote of the majority. God's not going to concede. It doesn't matter if America votes Him out or not. God doesn't have to favor our democracy. America needs to understand that God is not obligated to exalt our nation just because it's the great United States of America. Amen. He's not obligated to exalt Egypt, and He's not obligated to extinguish Israel either. But Pharaoh didn't like them. Pharaoh didn't want to listen to them. Pharaoh didn't want to worship their God. The world hates the church. The world don't, does not like what we preach. But listen, on the world's behalf, God is not obligated to take His church out of the world's way. That's why He's left it sitting in their way. Here we are, a, a stumbling block to the wise, Paul said. He's confounded the wise with foolish things. Foolish things such as preaching. God's not obligated to remove Israel from Egypt's way and from, from standing in Egypt's plan. I want to say this in conclusion. There will come a day when God in His time will take Israel out of Egypt. He waited about 430 years, but there came a day when it was time to get Israel out of there. And I said all that to say this, there will be an exodus of the family of God out of this world. I know it's been a couple of thousand years, but make no mistake about it, Jesus hasn't changed his mind. He's coming back. Amen. There's coming a day when the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout and voice of the archangel and trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye with the trumpet of God. Israel was gathered by the Red Sea with Moses, and Moses told them this, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And when Israel was safe over on the other side, they walked across on dry land. By the way, you can't create dry land by taking the sea and, uh, and, and some scientific explanation about how there was a, 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 a default or a fault line in the middle of that ocean and all the water ran off into that fault line. That's all fine and dandy, but their feet still would have been muddy. Somebody say amen. amen. God did all of that. Amen. And whenever they were safe over on the other side, When, when they were safe over on the other side, Egypt was left alone to face the wrath of God. There was no Moses there to stop the plagues like he always had before. You remember Pharaoh, every time God would send a plague, he would go straight to Moses. Do whatever you got to do. Pray for us. Whatever you got to do to get this thing stopped. And Moses would stop it. But after, the, after Israel was gone, <coughs> There was no stopping the plagues. In fact, they were consumed in the middle of the Red Sea. Let me tell you this. The world has no idea what kind of mess it's going to be in when God removes His children out of this world. The Bible uses a verse of Scripture. It says, when him that letteth be taken out of the way. I believe that's talking about the Holy Ghost. Uh, that word letteth means restrain. God is restraining some things from happening in this world right now. And the reason that He's... He, let, me, let me read it like I put it in my notes. He's holding back for the sake of His people and His cause. But when, the, when we're safe over on the other side, when, we, when we've made it over on dry land, we're safe over on the other side. When there's no churches to pray for the people, there's no churches to preach the truth of God's Word, there's no Holy Spirit as we know Him to operate in this world today to restrain this world is going to be consumed by the wrath of God. Greed by the people of God. They don't even understand what kind of grief is coming. 
By the time some folks figure out the value of the Lord's churches and the Lord's people, they will already be standing in front of God at the great white throne and it will be too late to be saved. God help us to get over our hatred of lost people even though they treat us bad, even though they treat the things of God bad. Let us get over our hatred of people for the way they treated us and the things of God because if we'll get busy for the Lord, we may be able to convince some of them to come with us. Amen. We may be able to convince some of Jesus Christ before it's too late. Because when, uh, when this world is over and the elements are burned up with the fervent heat, it's going to be too late to be saved. It's going to be too late. Let's stand. Lord, we thank you again for allowing us to be in your house today. Lord, we thank you for the sweet spirit in this place. The spirit of God that meets with us and, and uh, speaks to our hearts and stirs our hearts. Lord, we thank you for all that you do in our midst. Thank you for each and every family that's represented in this place today. And Lord, uh, thank you for the people of God uh, that, that even in a world that hates, hates you and hates the church, and, uh, and hates the family of God. Lord, we've got a people that we can pile up in the house of God with and pray for each other and encourage one another uh, to go on another mile, understanding this is going to be just a little while. And you're going to come take us out of here. All I know to say is, is even so, come Lord Jesus. Lord, we, we just ask that you bless the rest of this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.